Welcome. I'm Judith Rusi Kirshner, and I'm so glad you're here tonight for the first ever session of a great series called Histories Remixed. And because we're such a lucky small crowd, I'm going to ask those of you who are shy to come down if you'd like, because this will be a dialogue between Huey Copeland, who's the curator of this particular series, and Jim Minot. Huey Copeland, as many of you know, teaches at Northwestern in the Art History Department in the Graduate School, and he's also Associate Dean for Academic Affairs in the Graduate School. He's won so many awards, and his publications are so numerous that I will just touch highlights, including his role as contributing editor at Art Forum. What his work focuses on, and what's so interesting to us at the museum, is modern and contemporary art, but with an emphasis on the articulation of blackness in the Western visual field. Most notable in the rich range of Huey Copeland scholarship is a critically acclaimed book. It's called Bound to Appear, Art, Slavery, and the Sight of Blackness in Multicultural America. It's focused on the work of artists Renee Green, Glenn Ligon, Lorna Simpson, and Fred Wilson. And it was when I read this book that it inspired my invitation to Huey to invite him to curate a series for museum education about two years ago. The volume is actually a very remarkable reconsideration of how slavery shaped American art in the last decades of the 20th century. And in the work, Huey argues for a reorientation of modern and contemporary art history where the subject of race is concerned. And it was that reorientation that provoked the sort of response that we at the museum wanted that shared. At present, Huey is at work on a new book, In the Shadow of the Negress, A Brief History of Modern Artistic Practice, which explores the role played by the fictions of black womenhood in Western art from the 19th century to the present. And he's also working on a companion volume. And I'm only reading you these titles because they're so terrific. This one is tentatively titled, Touched by the Mother, contemporary artists, black masculinities, and the ends of the American century. And it brings us together many of his new writings as well as some published work. A very interdisciplinary thinker, Huey is also an imaginative curator and an editor. And tonight, he serves as our moderator for this first session of our new series with our distinguished guest, Jim Minot. Please join me in welcoming Huey Copeland and Jim Minot, who will enrich our understanding of the remixed cultural histories we all share. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. All right, there we are, look alive. Um, thank you, Judith, for that generous introduction, and thanks to y'all for coming out tonight. And thanks to the AIC education team, especially Fawn Ring, for making this event come together. Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce Jim Anote, the first speaker in Histories Remixed, which presents thought leaders from across the United States whose innovative institutional, musical, literary, or filmic practices have transformative implications, both for the horizons of contemporary artistic practice and the writing of cultural histories. The ultimate goal of this series is to encourage a lively exchange of ideas around how art is conceived, created, and presented, and how our cultural stories are told, and from whose perspectives. To my mind, such a brief could hardly be timelier. We live, after all, in an age when digital technologies make possible all manner of media recombinations across time and space, when once strictly observed boundaries between the arts have never seemed more porous so that New York's Museum of Modern Art, for instance, can mount a retrospective focused on Icelandic pop goddess Bjork, 
and a moment when histories long ignored, repressed, or unthought within mainstream institutional frames can now be reckoned with and engaged as part of the ethical and artistic project of rethinking national, political, cultural, and artistic legacies. It is precisely these conditions that informed the shaping of history's remix, which highlights practitioners whose field-turning interventions I have had the opportunity to experience firsthand through my own work as a scholar, critic, and teacher of contemporary art and culture. On March 3rd, Alicia Hall Moran, a singer known for brilliantly combining diverse musical styles like opera, R&B, and Motown, will present one of her trademark sight-sensitive musical responses, this time to the drawings of Martin Perrier, which will be on view here at the Art Institute in the exhibition Multiple Dimensions. On April 28th, writer and critic Rachel Kushner, author of the critically acclaimed novels Telex from Cuba and The Flamethrowers, will engage in a dialogue with the experimental filmmaker James Benning that explores how their practices differently aim to inhabit and reframe political and cultural touchstones of the European and American avant-garde from the 1960s and 70s to the present. In each instance of the series, and I hope to see you back uh, with your friends uh, March 3rd and April 28th, the speakers will provide new insights into the threads, emergent perspectives, and diverse positions in relationship to power and knowledge that subtend the American experience, quote unquote, and its cultural manifestations. Tonight is no exception. Indeed, I am absolutely thrilled that we're able to begin this series with a lecture by and conversation with Jim and Note, whose thinking has radically reframed my understanding of American art history and what might constitute critical museum studies. I first had the opportunity to hear Jim speak a little over two years ago in Santa Fe, and I was completely blown away both by the eloquence of his words and the radicality of his interventions into the framing and presentation of Zuni culture, which resonated deeply with the questions about cultural appropriation and stewardship confronting the Art Institute and other Western edifices of culture and collecting. A Zuni farmer and interrupted artist, Jim graduated from New Mexico State University with a degree in agriculture. Currently, he is the director of the Ashiwi Awan Museum and Heritage Center and director of the Colorado Plateau Foundation. He serves on the boards of the Grand Canyon Trust and Jesse Smith Noyes Foundation, and he's a senior advisor for Mountain Cultures at the Mountain Institute. He is a National Geographic Society explorer, a New Mexico community luminaria, and an EF Shoemaker Society fellow. In 2013, he received the Guardian of Culture and Lifeways Award from the Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries, and Museums, and in 2010, during the American Anthropological Association's annual conference, Jim was awarded the first Michael Ames Prize for Innovative Museum Anthropology. Kevin Gover, director of the National Museum of the American Indian, describes Jim as, quote, one of this nation's most important museum directors, unquote. I could not agree more, and I am so honored to be able to welcome Jim for a discussion of his work. Please join me in welcoming to the stage. I just told Huey, I got this. I have a little bit of a, a scratchy throat, so I'm going to be drinking a little water while I'm talking. Well, well not when I'm talking, but between talking. Um, so I'm from Zuni, New Mexico. Anybody know where Zuni, New Mexico is? One, two, or three. Well, but when I'm at the airport sometimes traveling somewhere, especially if I'm back east somewhere, I might be at the airport, and someone approaches me and says, oh, you're Native American, aren't you? And I'd say, yeah, yeah. And they'd say, I can tell, but the hair, OK? Or sometimes they say, are you Apache? And I'd say, no. Are you Cherokee? I'd say, no. You're Sioux? I'd say, no. I'd say, I'm Zuni, and they'd say, and they, okay, <laughs> speaking louder, right? 
So they'd ask me if I'm Sue, if I'd say no. Am I Apache? I'd say no. Are you Sue? And I'd say no. I'd say I'm Zuni. And then they'd turn around and oh, we'll walk away. <laughs> Never heard of it. Well, Zuni is located roughly uh, what is now called New Mexico and Arizona, but straddling the border, that area, that Four Corners area, the southwest. That's, that's where I'm from. Just want to do a little bit of performance, get your attention. But, but I'm going to talk a little bit today about not only history and history of remix as it pertains to Zuni, but also as it pertains to Native America in general. And I, I think this is really interesting because what I was telling you about people saying, are you Apache? No. Are you Cherokee? No. Are you Sioux? No. Is that, that says something about why don't people know more about Zuni or Hopi or Haida or Seminoles or others, right? What do people mostly know about? They know about Thanksgiving. They know about Indians and maybe uh, Sacagawea, or they know just those sort of things, right? Why is that? What, what sort of powers are there? What, what's at play? What kind of agency is involved there that enables that to happen? So we'll talk about that tonight. So at my place, we have a long, long history. We've been in the same place, some people would say maybe 8,000 years. That Zuni language has been spoken maybe 7,000 years. I don't know how people can figure that out. Linguists say that. But we've been there a long time. And we've had a long, long history that's been inscribed in stone. Sometimes it's performed. Sometimes it's said in prayers. A number of things. We've seen things happen. We've seen images. And we, we reproduce them, whether it's in arts, um, sometimes, like for example, uh, ceramics, images of a bird flying like that, reproduced in ceramics, or maybe woven into a textile. And we have these histories and we put them into images and we remember them, we talk about them, we sing about them, we perform them. The Grand Canyon, we know of this place, this is where we came from, the Zuni people. We emerged from there and then explored all the tributaries of the Colorado Plateau until we settled to where we are now. Things that are beautiful, the colors, all these things, how do you describe them without a script? So one time I remember I was, I was visiting down south in Central America and then I was in Mexico City at the Museum of Anthropology there and I looked at these wonderful books that the people had made there from a long, long time ago and the way people had inscribed into stone, that hard limestone, and they had glyphs, and I thought, how cool is that? Why don't we have that? And I tried making some paper. I tried making it with corn. I tried making it with all kinds of other things that we have at home at Zuni, where I live, and it just didn't work. We couldn't make paper. I couldn't make decent paper to write on. And then like, on the sandstone where I live, you can't really make a lot of detail. It, it flakes and falls off. And I thought, well, maybe that's why we don't have paper. Maybe that's why we don't have books. And I thought, well, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe, maybe that's a good thing. And my grandmother used to tell me, don't read so much. Just listen, just listen. Well, I ended up going to college and I had to read some, but. But I think it's interesting, too, a part of history for us, and I think other Native peoples, too, is, is through oral transmission, talking, listening, and memorizing. Thinking about this place, this beautiful place in the Grand Canyon, this, this place called Ribbon Falls, what in Zuni is called Chimikyanikadea, a beautiful place. We know of that place because we tell each other about it, or different phenomena. Things like this that are beautiful, and we recreate them, we sing about them, we have dances about them, songs about rainbows. They endure, the part of our history. So the history isn't just what happens sometimes, sometimes the history is an entire phenomenon, the world all around us. Things that change, the climate is part of our history. Where we moved, where we came from, is all part of our history. All these sort of phenomena, even in a single day you can have a history. 
You can develop your own pattern language of when you wake up and where you go, where you get your coffee or drive your car or take a bus as part of your history, part of your pattern. And so we're, we, we've taken these, all this, this knowledge, these ideas, and it isn't just sort of a one side of our brain, we must remember these things, but sometimes we think, you know, it's such a beautiful place, I want to make something that represents it. That beautiful blue water, maybe some jewelry, or hunting, or seeing things like this, I want to recreate it and memorialize it. Things like this, jewelry. These are my cousins, some of my cousin's works. Some birds that he remembers that he really enjoyed seeing. And so histories remix. I, th I thought about this when, when Huey approached me and asked me to speak about this. And again, it made me think, well, there is quite a lot of things that are about history remixing, but also I think what we're doing now is doing some counter history, counter history making, because there's a lot of things to correct. There's a lot of things. In, in 1540, the, the Spanish arrived to my part of the world and they were there a relatively short time, but they came from Europe, obviously. They first made contact with the peoples of North America, first around the Caribbean area, uh, and then in, in more Central America, and then made their way up north looking for riches, looking for those sort of things. And they came to where we live at Zuni and took over the place, basically. And, but they also brought things with them. They brought horses, they brought chickens, they brought wheat, they brought sheep, they brought pigs, peaches, things like this, which were new to this part of the world, or the, our part of the world. And we pick and chose what things we would use. But also there were some things that the Spanish brought, well, the foods, for example, that many of our people suffer now from things like too much of this, you know, too much of the meats or the sugars or these other things but we've been picking and choosing which ones to keep. For some cultures, the horses became a very important, important part of their lives, a very important part of their cultures. For others, maybe it was sheep and so on, or wheat or farming. So some things we've incorporated into our lives and cultures, but other things we rejected. And actually in 1680, there was a revolt and the Spanish were driven out from that part of the world. They never returned to Zuni and Hopi, but they did return to other parts of the Southwest. Advancing a little forward now, a little faster, let's say in 1800s. In 1879, the, one of the first ethnographers appeared on the scene, uh, Frank Hamilton Cushing. Around this time, of the, this time, 1800s, late 1800s, there was concern that because of globalization, industrialization, all sorts of other things, that we would soon be extinct in the Southwest, and that, that our, our lives and our culture would go the way of many tribes in the East Coast and in the Midwest. And so people like Frank Cushing were dispatched to Zuni and other places to study, to study and learn what they can about our people. And it was interesting. He, he wrote a lot of things, uh, made a lot of observations. People say that he was the the, the father of participatory observation and actually lived in Zuni for quite some time and spoke Zuni. But also he was, he was intrusive. He was intrusive and he, he wrote things down that he shouldn't have written down. And there were some things in our, in our world that we don't share. And actually where I come from, when I was growing up, we were told that you're gonna have to, well the kids, kids we were told, you're going to have to leave the room because the adults are going to talk about something and you can't be here for that. Or they'd say, you can't go into that closet, don't open that up because there's things in there you can't see. Or you're not supposed to know this. Or you can't ask these questions until you get to the age where you'll be initiated into a certain group. And so for our people, when we finally do get to that age, we might be initiated into a Kiva society or maybe later into a rain priesthood or bow priesthood or a medicine society, these sort of things. We're initiated into that group and each group holds onto that knowledge tightly. They protect it, they know it, 
and they hold it tightly. And so we end up with these silos of knowledge. And not everybody has access to it. You have to be initiated into that group to have access to it. That's the, that's the way we share, transfer, and access knowledge. You have to be initiated into that group. When I went to a university, and professors were telling me that knowledge is free and it flows and we share, we publish, we talk, that knowledge belongs to everyone. And I thought, that's different. That's different from where I came from. And so right away I started to understand that we live in a world with different ways of knowing, a world with different kinds of ontologies, different spheres of knowledge. Well, this, this Frank Cushing came to Zuni and started writing about things and fancied himself, you know, almost as a Zuni. And later on, there was a, a, a Zuni artist that actually wrote a cartoon book about him. It's kind of funny, it's, but it's interesting. It was, it's, a, it's a really popular book with, with anthropologists and ethnographers. But it was, in a sense, a kind of intervention, you know, that these ethnographers, anthropologists, and archaeologists, well, I think it's a very noble field. I have nothing against archaeologists, ethnographers, and archaeologists, but there was, there was this idea that knowledge is free. Knowledge, we access it. Everybody has access to it. But that's not necessarily the case everywhere. And actually, if you were to go to some archives, even the Holocaust archive, for example, you may not have access to everything there. Some things are restricted. We live in a world sometimes really where some things are restricted, but not, every, not everybody gets that idea. So as the ethnographers, archaeologists, and anthropologists, and others were coming to our world, they were also collecting things, not only making notes, but also collecting. And as we know in museums and other centers, there's a lot of this idea of collecting, collecting. And that began, as, as you probably know, in Europe there were, there were people that had, had the means were able to collect things from different parts of the world, from different cultures. They invite friends over, and they had their, their parties, and they had this big cabinet of curiosity. You know, that, look at Iagon, look at these things I collected and collected and collected. Their house was full of interesting, cool things. Maybe cool, I don't know, but they're collecting things. They expanded later to universities, and then to private institutions, and museums grew and grew and became pretty much a global phenomenon. But it carries some baggage also. Museums carry some baggage. You know, many people think of them at home as like a bones and pots and scary things also. Actually, when I came here, I went through the gallery this, this morning, oh, I'm sorry, this afternoon, and I saw some funerary objects in the, from the Southwest, and it made me feel a little uneasy because, not because they were just funerary objects and that they were very old, but because I didn't know who they belonged to. You know, so what part of history is that messing with, right? Would you want Pol Pot's wristwatch in your nightstand? You know, there's, if you don't know who these things belong to, it makes you wonder, you wonder. But collect, nevertheless. People came and they collected, and they collected lots of things. They're still collecting. And what we are finding also is that now in modern times, this, this time right now, that there's a lot of information out there in collections at many museums, and it, they are much more easily accessible to get to that information than it was 30 years ago. 30, 40 years ago, for us to approach a museum and ask, what kinds of things that are Zuni do you have in your collections? Do you have any Zuni things? And we'd write a letter. That's when you did the email. You had to write a letter, type a letter sometimes. And we get a response, and the museums would say, well, uh, what is your research proposal, and what are your credentials? And I would write, I have a BS in agriculture. Actually, I'm a darn good farmer, really. But, but they, they'd say, okay, well, you know, you need, you need to see your proposal, what is your research proposal, and so on. I, and I would write and say, we just want to know what things you have that might be Zuni. We want to know what condition they're in. We want to know if they're safe. We want to know what you have. And it was just difficult to get our feet in the door. And then 
1990, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act was passed, and that opened the door a lot more. Uh, museums and other institutions were required to inventory their collections and let people know, let the tribes know, affiliated tribes, what they have. And they were required to return human remains and sacred objects, funerary objects, and things like that. That was a big change. What that also did was at least it started to do something about these powers. And soon we were getting floppy disks. Soon we were, well, first we were getting big binders of, of, of catalogs. And then we got floppy disks and then later CDs, and then now you can go online. And we started to see what was in the collections. And we started to look at them. We were reading them and reading them. And this is me as a museum director and with our staff. We would look at those things and we'd say, That's, that sounds really peculiar. I wonder what that looks like. That doesn't sound right. We'd look at more catalog descriptions. And finally, one time, one year, we went to the University of Cambridge in, in, uh, in the UK. And we went to the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, and we looked at some things, some things there. And I remember we opened some things. We were looking at it, and something said, a bone pendant. Something like North America, Southwest, Pueblo and Zuni, question mark, bone pendant. And we looked at it, and one of my colleagues said, well, it, it's bone, but it's more than a bone pendant. It's actually a turkey call. He picked it up. And psh, 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 psh. He said, there's different ways you can make it. And, and he went on and on for about 20 minutes. And then we went to the next thing, and we picked it up, and he said, no, that's not what it is. It's actually this. And the next thing, and next thing, and next thing. It was always like inadequate, obviously, information. But sometimes we figured there was about 82% descriptions were wrong. At the University, of, no, sorry, at, at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, I wish I had the image, but in the catalog, the catalog said Zuni net sinker. If you know where Zuni is, remember it's high, dry country. Zuni net sinker. What the hell could that be? So we went and we looked, pulled, went to the drawers and the collection center and pulled it out. It was just a small axe head. It's like somebody thought it was a weight for a net, but it wasn't. And, and so this was repeating. At, at more museums we went to, we were finding the descriptions were obviously inadequate, but also many were just wrong. At the University of Cambridge, we saw a set of items, and we looked at them, we said, no, that's not what these are, no, that's not what these are. And, and the staff there had this look on their face like, oh my goodness. And I said, what's wrong? And he said, that a student just received her, her uh, doctoral degree based on this collection. And I said, well, how many degrees have you bestowed on students based on a lot of this wrong information? And he said, a lot. And so this conversation led to, it's, it's, it's in your interest for us to work together. One, foremost, of course, for us, is that many of our young people, well, adults also, are learning about themselves, learning about their history and identity online. And often they're going through archival, archival materials, manuscripts, photographs, uh, but also going online and seeing the physical collections as well and learning something about themselves and their identity and their history. If it's wrong, that's not good. And for museums, if, they're go if there's going to be scholars doing research on the, with using the collections, it's in their best interest to have the record set straight as well. So one of my mantras has been setting the record straight setting the record straight. So we did this little experiment, and we, we took some images of things in the museum at Cambridge, and we just exposed Zunis to them, Zuni tribal members. What do you think of this? And they look at it and say, oh, it's, it's this. And they talk about it, talk about it. OK, what about this image? And they talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. And we, we did that for about 200 people. And then we put all the numbers together. And basically, we, we create these, this sphere, this diagram. On the, on the right side is what the museums often had. So let me back up here. You know, a, a kind of a very typical 
museum catalog. Many places are like this, right? So similar on the right side, an ID number, notes, cultural group, so on. But on the left side, the Zuni descriptions were much different, much more rich contextually, all kinds of interesting things about that item, and that's the information from the source. That's coming from the source. There's a big difference between the two, isn't there? And so what we also realized and came to understand is that many collections are digitized, right? Of course, these days. But the problem is many museums, one museum will have their collection using something called Past Perfect or EMU, or they have their own customized system. And so different museums, while they all may have Zuni collections, they're using disparate systems. So they can't communicate together. We can't build relationships among those items, those collections. Because we were going to some museums and saying, okay, these three things are part of a set. The rest of the set is at this other museum. Did you know that? And they'd say, no, we didn't know that. Or, you know, this photograph of these people here, the things that they're making are at this other museum. Did you know that? No, we didn't know that. And so how are we going to develop relationships amongst the physical collections and the archival materials if the systems are not operable? There's a lack of interoperability. That's a very important thing. That's not, that's not my area. Uh, I can barely work my, my cell phone. But um, we brought together some very smart people, and we created a system at our small museum that brought together partner museums collections, all their Zuni collections. So whether it was the Museum of, uh, American Museum of Natural History in New York, or the Maxwell, or the Denver Art Museum, Cambridge Museum, they provided us with the data of all their Zuni collections, and we put it in one system at our museum, at our place. So over, over 10,000 Zuni things, just at this, those museums. And so we were able to look at those things, the images, and provide commentary, provide input, write about them. And I kind of sort of joke with, with some of the other museums. I'd say, well, thank you for being a satellite of our museum. <laughs> but this wasn't easy to, to sell. You know, I, as I said, it was difficult getting our foot in the door to begin with. But once we started being saying like things like, it's in your best interest, in our interest, we can make this work, we started to get the ball rolling. And we created the system. And so things like this one here, we can look at a particular object in a collection and have video, commentary, or we could do uh, just sound or, or text. And we could keep it at home, at Zuni, just keep it there if it's, if it's sensitive information, or we can push it back to the holding institution and say, you know what, you have new information about item number such and such. Add that to your description. Just more similar things like that. And so we, we have this system at our, our modest little museum, and we could provide information and share it if we wanted to. And what is this doing also is it's dealing with this asymmetry of power, right? Where we were saying, you know what, now we know, we know these things about the items in your collection that you don't know. Before, when they were having, giving us a hard time of getting our foot in the door, now we're saying we have a lot of information, and if, and if you're nice to us, we'll share it with you. Not quite in that way, but... So this is very helpful for Zuni, of course. As I said, some of the information can just stay at Zuni, or we can choose to share it. That really does something about that asymmetry of power. So now, this, this being such a visual... Uh, generation, at least, well, no more than that, uh, probably five generations. And my, my great-grandparents were born in the 1800s, and they knew about photography and film a long time ago. They, they didn't think it was hocus-pocus magic stuff, 
they knew generally that it was, there was a, a plate of glass and, and light would shine on it in a certain way and, and you put it in some liquid and it would somehow capture and, and mirror that image that it was reflecting off of it. They got that. Well, in, in the 19, when was it? 1923 at Zuni, there were some filmmakers that came and were filming this kind of daily life kind of stuff, shearing, no, I'm not shearing, but making, making things out of deer skins, making pottery, uh, making bread, things like this. But then the, the filmmakers started f filming some very important sacred ceremonies, and Zunis didn't like that. Um, and we saw this film in New York at the American Museum of Natural History. We'd seen some others, but we watched this film. A group of us were there doing some collection review. We watched this film, and we were watching it and kind of going like this, like, I don't know if I'm supposed to see some of this. And we saw some things like, wow, so that's what goes on over there, or the, so that's what goes I don't know if I'm supposed to see that. And, and when it was finished, we, we were all quiet. And then one person asked, who does this film belong to? And the, the staff said, well, it was 1923, and it's, um, it was shot on film, or negative, right? And we don't know how many reproductions were made from those negatives. And also now it's open source, and the plan is to digitize it. And we thought, well, so essentially, we don't have control over it. So we talked and talked about this for a while, and I said, how about, can you give us a digital copy? A digital copy is not the same thing as repatriation. Don't ever let anybody say digital repatriation. I hate those two words used together. Repatriation and digital should not be used together. But they gave us a copy, and we remade the film. We took out parts that were sensitive. The film had uh, intertitles, you know, text in them, and much of them were wrong. And <clears throat> so we remade the film. We did a voiceover in Zuni language and did new intertitles. And this was one important moment, this image here. But also, as I said, just like with physical collections, there's a lot of wrong information in that film. And so we remade it, and things like uh, the film had written in it, it said, the fire god is the keeper of the fire and represents the sun. And first of all, we said, it's not a fire god. When many of the early ethnographers and uh, anthropologists were at Zuni, Understandably, they were, many of them were Christian and assumed that the things that we were taking great care and respecting and making offerings to, that they must be a kind of a God. And so that God got into the books, even into today's Zuni vernacular in English. Even Zunis will say the fire God. And so now we're having to say it's not fire God. You know the Zuni name for it. It's Shulawitsi. But even things like that got into our vernacular. So this was part of this setting the record straight. Recently, <clears throat> you may have heard that there were some auctions in Paris of some sacred items. Many of them were Hopi, some were Zuni, some were Akama, some were Laguna. And they were very sacred things and put on the auction block. How they got there, we're not sure, but nevertheless, this was going on. Many people tried to have in, or invoke things like the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Many people were trying to use other instruments of law and commerce, but they didn't apply in France. They didn't have, have that power of law in France. It's just different there. And so while 
While lawyers were doing their noble work and others were doing their work to shame, others were protesting, I had this idea that we had been visiting probably 32 museums over the past 30 years and looking at collections and, and reviewing them in detail. And over the years, we've seen a substantial number of replicas, a lot of fakes, a lot of replicas, a lot of pseudo-ceremonial things are museums. But who knows that they're pseudo-ceremonial? Who knows that they're fakes? Because in the museum, it says this, you know, it's, it's the real deal. We looked at it and said, what the hell is this? It wasn't. So I wrote, I said, okay, well, let the lawyers do their thing and let others shame. Um, it was translated into French, but I wrote to the, to the auction house director, and the full letter isn't here, it's a two-page letter, but basically I said, buyer beware. You may be holding fakes, and the only people that can clearly, definitely identify them as real or not are people from the source, and we're not about to do that. So buyer beware. So similarly, there is, there's also a lot of sale of, of, of arts, a lot of native arts, including Zuni art, is being reproduced. And there are a lot of fakes out there as well in, in, in the commercial market. So the only people that can identify, only people that can validate is people from the source. Like a detective story, if you want to know the truth, you go to the source. What about maps? Maps are a very important part of our history. Well, we've always had maps. It's just that over the past 500 years, we've been remapped. We've had maps and songs and prayers etched in stone. We've always had maps. But maps have come, and now things are named in Spanish or English and other names. And so we decided to do a kind of different kind of map, kind of. Well, you'll see. But first of all, we realize that maps are very powerful. You can lie with maps. You can raise property values with maps. You can say this map, you can make a map, at your, probably with your home computer, you can make a map that say this is low crime area. Or you can make a map that says this is prime farmland. But it's not truth, but you can do that. Practically anybody can make a map. Maps are also very arbitrary. They inform this and not necessarily that. And they're part of our history. We're mapping the universe. We're even mapping our DNA. We use maps a lot. But maps can be confusing for some people, difficult to use. And so we decided Let's make some other kinds of maps. Let's make some maps that are part of, of Zuni's own kind of sensibility of colors and, and symbology, but also the way we share and transmit knowledge in our own kind of vignettes of information. Let's make those kind of maps. And so we brought together some artists and some religious leaders, and the first thing we talked about, the first thing we said was what not to map. And then after we got that cleared up, after about a year of discussion, we started making maps. And now we have about 32 pieces in this collection. Beautiful oil on canvas pieces, at least this big. Watercolors, acrylic on canvas, they're big maps. Beautiful. And right now they are at uh, the Fowler Museum at UCLA. They just opened their exhibit. Before that, they were at American Museum of Natural History in New York City. But they're maps. And they were kind of counter-mapping, still part of that counter-history, setting the record straight on our terms. And this is a map. Some people would say, well, how do I know where, where are the roads? Well, it doesn't have to have the roads. North doesn't even have to be at the top. What's important is what is being said here, what is, what is visual about it. Many Zunis, when they come to see this piece, they look at it and they say, it's just beautiful. 
And then somebody will say, oh, this is that place, or this is where this happened, oh, this is where we go for that. Whether it's a certain plant collection or turtle collections, other things that are going on here. And then the maps become evocative. People talk about them. When we created some maps before about the Grand Canyon, places that are important to us, and we gave those computer-made maps to the National Park Service, they took the maps and said, well, thank you, they, and they pulled out the map cabinet and they put it in. We made some posters of these kinds of maps in the Grand Canyon, and we gave them to the Park Service, the superintendent of the National Park Service, and the superintendent and the staff said, oh my goodness, we need to get a frame for these. It had a completely different impact. This is also a map. Now, when, it's on, when I was doing some docent training a couple of weeks ago, I was telling some of the, the people there, I said, well, at, at some point you're going to have to surrender. You're not going to understand everything that's going on because these were first made for a Zuni audience. So not everybody has access to that kind of knowledge. Now, mascots. I was going to say, don't get me started on this, but I had to. Um, you know, for, for all the work that we do in our museum and in schools to nurture and build our identity and our history and reflect on all that, and to see some of these mascots undermining that, that really pisses me off. And a couple of years ago, I was surprised. I was really surprised. I was in my office in our museum, and our, our tribal leader came in and said, can you come out and talk with the owner of the Washington Redskins? And I said, hell yeah, I'll come out and talk with him. <laughs> and he said, no, no, don't bring that up, don't bring that up. I said, okay, all right, okay. So I went out and I talked with Mr. Snyder, Dan, and his entourage about the contributions that Native people have made to the history of this great country. And that Zunis in particular, the kind of contributions we are making and will make. We talked about that, about how we're setting the record straight and different ways we're doing that. And then I walked them to their cars and I put my hand on his shoulder, the owner, and I said, you know, I like football. And I like to watch it on TV, but I really don't like that name of your team. And he snapped back at me and he said, we're a football team. So uh, it was interesting. Within a day, it got picked up by USA, USA Today and by Sports Illustrated. Um, but yeah, where was it? I saw at that moment quite clearly it did not concern him. And so my colleagues at the National Museum of American Indian, this is very important to them also, as it is to the National Congress of American Indians, that, yeah, why is it that in history, why is it that this people, that people in this country, when they think of Native peoples, they think of Thanksgiving? Why do they not know about Zuni, Hopi, Seminoles, Haidas, and others? Why is that? That's, that's unfortunate. And we're going to make that change. So the takeaways, there are several, right? We live in a world with different ways of knowing. There are different spheres of knowledge. Remember that diagram? There's the way we look at these things, and there's the way the museum looks at the things. I think that the science is a sphere of knowledge. I'm trained in sciences too. And then there's indigenous knowledge. I have colleagues that talk about native science or indigenous science, and I say, you know, I don't think there's such a thing. My grandmother, if I remember correctly, science is about measuring matter, creating hypotheses, testing hypotheses, and so on. My grandmother very rarely, with us, very rarely needed to count above 10. After that, it was just M, a lot. And when we go into our, our sacred places, our kivas, where we have some religious doings going on, and the leaders tell us to do this and do that and so on, we say, yeah, okay. Nobody says, prove it. We just say, yes, we will do that. We live in a world with different ways of knowing. Even the maps. Some maps are very geometric. 
very, with a lot of numbers, longitude and latitudes, and the maps we make are not. There's just different ways of looking at the same things. Setting the record straight. Museums are trend-setting places. We go to museums to learn about new advances in art, new things happening in art, new techniques, new methods, wonderful things that inspire us. We go to museums to learn about new science and technology. Museums are trend-setting places, and therefore it is important to have the record set straight, especially in museums. And this work is definitely about reconciliation around this asymmetry of powers, very much so. We're not finished, but we have a lot of work to do. We're getting there. This requires collaboration, a true collaboration, real true collaboration where us, myself, or others, we agree on an outcome, something that we're going to finish together, some product, and we agree and promise that we will co-labor to make those things happen, that we will co-elaborate. Just some situations at different museums where we have been collaborating. The School for Advanced Research in Santa Fe, the National Museum of Ethnography in Osaka, Japan. It was a really tough nut to crack, let me tell you. I mean, you think, well, the, you know, the Europe is pretty hardcore. Talk about staid old institutions. Europe is hard. The U.S., you know, there's, there's things that are, I would never want to live anywhere else besides here. And I think the museums in the U.S. are way ahead of the other museums around the world, frankly. Europe is tough, uh, but Japan was even tougher. But we are very persuasive, very persuasive. And I'll tell you a story about that maybe later. American Museum of Natural History. That was a tough nut also. But they understood it. And they could see it. setting the record straight was a very important, very important part, not only for the history of their work and their institution, but history in general, and our history in particular. And so, collaboration, setting the record straight, building something together, and elaborating, this is our future. This is what we're going to do. And I was telling Huey earlier, we're going to bang shoulder pads, and we're going to do this. We're going to make this happen. Well, I look forward to having a conversation with Huey. That is all for my part. Thank you so much for that uh, incredibly <coughs> rich and inspiring and uh, encyclopedic talk. You took us through a lot of uh, wonderful places. And I think one of the wonderful uh, consistent takeaways was this you know, emphasis on different ways of knowing, different epistemologies, different ways of kind of confronting and understanding the world. And I think um, the kind of contrast that you laid out between a certain kind of um, Western democratic sense of knowledge and wanting to map and know everything versus a Zuni epistemology where there are certain things that should not be known by certain people and cannot be known is a really kind of rich and productive counter, I think, to this way in which um, Western institutions and museums try to produce everything as constantly open and available um, for inspection and knowledge. And I just wonder if you could maybe talk a little bit about the kind of ramifications for museum practice of this different epistemological frame that emphasizes certain things that one shouldn't have access to. Well, so, yeah, there are a lot of still museums, as I was saying, they're very state old institutions. Mm -hmm. And I think. 30 years ago, majority of them, I would just say, were in the difficult category. Mm. You know, I, was, I was saying we would write letters and get back these letters like, well, what do you want to do? What's your research proposal? And what are your credentials? And things like that. 
that was 30 years ago. The thing that I, makes me really hopeful is that those people that were in those positions as collections managers or curators and so mm. on have retired mm. and moved on. And I remember, like say 15 years ago, there were some junior staff, I don't want to say subordinate, but you know, junior staff that were saying, they would whisper in my ear and they'd say, I really think this is what we should be doing. What, yeah. you're, what you're talking about really makes sense. But she's not about to retire in the next few years, so I can't say anything. <laughs> but those people did retire. And we have some new staff in there. There's some more hip people in different museums all over that are saying that, you know, we have these things from your place. It makes sense that we should honor your way of organizing them, how you order your knowledge. Because I would explain also at our museum, mm. we try to mirror the Zuni uh, system of knowledge, how we mm. share, transfer. And they said, you know what, why, we, why can't we do this? Why don't we try to do something similar? So if you think that only women should handle these or mm. not, or only these should be seen by men or these, so on, so they say, I don't see any reason why we can't. Yes. So it's changing, it is changing. And I think that's just part of, you know, it's one thing to have an image that represents a people and culture. Mm. But I think there's, there's the way that they live also yes. is part and parcel of that. Yeah. Our yeah. life isn't just about that shoe or that rock or that glass. Yeah. It's yeah. how we live it. Well, and that's fascinating too because then that begins to suggest a way of being, bringing in Zuni you know, protocols for engagement with objects and Zuni modes of sort of performing a relationship to them into the museum. So it's not about just the thing itself, it's about how you perform, how you comport yourself in relationship to it. And I wonder, I mean, for you, I mean, what would you attribute this shift or sea change that you've seen happening in terms of museums' attitudes and openness in the last 30, 40 years and maybe accelerating the last 15 years? I mean, is this something that we would, you know, attribute to uh, the larger trend, particularly in North America, to a kind of multicultural sensibility, or are there other kinds of factors um, that you would see? Well, as I, I think yeah, one, one part you have you hit on right, done right is that people are just understanding that there's important to have diversity, not only just the kind of diversity that we're aware of, you know, just going to have more diversity in gender and everything else, mm -hmm. but also people are beginning to understand that. Native peoples are, are not represented well enough, but mm -hmm. also there are some Native peoples that are definitely having some influence. Mm. We're beginning to understand the channels of influence, you know, the channels of influence, and that's making a difference. We're able to do that. And so in terms of thinking about those kind of channels of influence, I mean, I love hearing you speak about the work that you've done at the museum because it really brings out the possibility for, you know, shifting the ways in which uh, museums understand uh, Zuni objects, how they engage with them, how they categorize them. But I wonder about uh, the direction the other way in terms of, you know, the experiences that you and your team have had going to see particular materials and saying, oh my goodness, this is something, you know, that rescripts a sense of the, the narrative uh, that the, the community might be producing and constructing about itself and its history. Well, yeah, uh, I think that what, what we're finding too is that as we're having more access, mm. more mobility, we're also learning how the system works. And at first, it was just sort of a, a core team of people that we would work with from, from Zuni. And now we're learning that there's an additional kind of responsibility on our half, not mm -hmm. only for the museums. Mm -hmm. The museums have to get it and be willing to work with us, but also we have to take some responsibility as well. So when we take a group to do some collections reviews to look at things, we can't just say, oh, all of these are Zuni. Mm -hmm. we, we have to say, we have to be honest and say this, I can't say definitively, absolutely, that is Zuni, mm. then so I won't say it is. Or this design, I'm not gonna make it up. I'm gonna mm. have to say, I don't know. 
because if you just make shit up, I mean, if you, <laughs> yeah. if, if you, if you say, oh, yeah, it's all Zuni, that doesn't help the system either. Yeah. And, and so similarly, if another tribe or another group of people comes in and say, yeah, these are all our stuff, but they aren't, that doesn't help the field either. Yeah. So we have to be, be thinking about our, our responsibilities to the field also. Mm. If we're going to say, if we're not going to, we're, we're not going to acquiesce. Yeah, yeah. And just let, let the field do as they choose, we're going to be part of engaging and shaping it. But to do that, we have to be responsible in doing that too. Right, and part of that responsibility is embracing the limitations of one's own knowledge yes. uh, in terms of how one can engage these. Exactly. So I wonder, I mean, if you could maybe talk to us and tell us how you came to do this work and to assemble this team over the years. I was lucky. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, partly because uh, where I live, we're, we are a tribe that is essentially one village, albeit a large village. Um, other peoples, other tribes are spread out across a large area. Like say Navajos, for example, mm -hmm. live a long, big area. And Hopis are on separate mesas, or other tribes are spread out. We are one village. And so we're able to uh, bring t people together rather easily. Um, we, have, we know who the people in a community are with standing. Mm. That's an important thing too, is that who has standing in our community that can speak to these things with authorities. Um, and I think, it, 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 not to put myself on a pedestal, but it takes somebody to have the, the will to keep moving things forward mm. and advancing because it can get tiring, it can be frustrating to do it for five years, for 10 years, for 20 years, you just have to keep moving. You just have to keep doing it. As I said, I just happen to be in the right place at the right time. I'm very lucky often, mm. but it, it takes something like that. And it worries me actually, quite honestly, sometimes if, if I was to step out or if I was to get ill or something happens, what would happen? Mm. Um, and I should be mentoring more people, but I think now that um, this idea has become not only a particular thing for Zuni and others, but there are other tribes mm. and other museums that are getting it, and it's becoming more of a movement, mm. not just an activity and a project. A project has a beginning and an end. And it's one thing to say, we will work with you to review this collection, we will work with you to create this database, we will work with you to do this. That's a project, it has a beginning and an end. But I see this more as a movement. Mm -hmm. a real sound movement around collaboration. And so you said in your talk um, that it was, there was more openness to this movement and the transformation in the North American, particularly kind of U.S. context. And then you sort of mentioned the particular difficulties that you faced in going to Osaka. And I just wondered, I mean, of course I was curious. So I wonder if you could maybe sort of talk about some of those um, difficulties and the challenges you see in terms of making this a kind of global movement. Uh, well, yes, yeah, like say for uh, Japan, for example, there's some brilliant people. I mean, as you can imagine, smart, smart people with uh, you know, amazing museums, incredible museums that were built during the big bubble economy, mm. beautiful museums. Um, but there, some of their uh, methods, I think, were still, we, we do the collecting, we maybe invite people to look at some things, we tell them what they're going to see, mm. uh, we put, we like, okay, please come take a look at these. This is what we want you to comment on or look at. Are these the right things? So on, so on. But that to me is not true collaboration. Mm. Um, and so during a one visit um, a couple of years ago, I was there with another Zuni person and I was wearing a, a different piece of jewelry. And there was one, one person there, a Japanese uh, scholar who was a, a well, he was a scholar of Southwest Native Arts. Mm. And also there was the director of the Museum of Northern Arizona. Both people that would generally be considered experts. Mm. And I, I took off my, my bolo tie and I, I just said, I'm gonna put you on a spot, but it, I, I mean well. And I said, what can you tell me about this piece? And both those, both the experts, the director and the, the scholar said, well, it's, it's this, and it has this and so on, and it's you know, silver and so on. And 
I said, okay, that's, that's very good. And I, I said, I'm going to give it to my, my colleague here from Zuni. And I said, what can you tell me about this? And he said, oh, yeah, I know these people. And, you know, so-and-so, he was a, a, a sheep herder, or he raised sheep, but he, mm. also, he was also in the army, and he was captured in the Philippines and survived the Bataan Death March. And this piece was not made by him. It was actually made by he and his wife together as a team. Mm -hmm. And he went on for about 20 minutes talking about this one piece. And so this, this again, made this, this, this argument that if you want to get the truth, but if you want to get really good information, you have to go to the source. And so it was from that actual putting them on a spot that the Japanese museum said, we need to do more collaboration with source communities. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're good people. They're yeah. smart people. But it, you know, it, sometimes it takes something that's really, really persuasive and, and makes sense. Yeah. It was like setting the record straight. No, and I think, I mean, also, I mean, that's such an amazing moment because it speaks to the way in which, you know, through this work, you're able to actually, you know, show that these, you know, materials, these artifacts have histories, they have biographies that are related to particular individuals. They're not just kind of emanations from the culture, right, that you can sort of situate them in this kind of community of makers. And I think the way in which the museum is doing its work is really emphasizing a kind of different notion of the museum as a place of gathering histories of a community, but also having the kind of community inform what the museum should be, what its sort of operative assumptions are. Um, so I could go on asking Jim questions, I think, uh, for a very long time, but I won't. Um, and I will open it up to some questions uh, from you in the audience. Thank you for that um, thoughtful and thought-provoking talk. And I appreciated, in particular, your comment about um, authenticity and truth coming from the source. And it led me, of course, to wonder what happened or happens when there is not consensus at the source. And also, um, how do you deal with the fact that um, authenticity and truth is dynamic and can change through time. Well, the first part of the question, uh, if there's conflicts or there's, there's different people that have the same idea of what authenticity is at the source. I think around sacred items, ceremonial items, we, I can't think of any time that there has ever been an issue of that for us. For us, I mean, that could be different elsewhere because as I said, we're, we're in one large village, a place where everybody knows each other, for better or worse. But, um, but also around authorities of who knows things. I always ask a similar question at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. When we were providing information into that database that I was describing about objects, right? That we are providing information. And one of the staff at the museum said, how do we know that information is any good? And I said, how do we know the information you're providing is any good? because obviously it's been inadequate and often wrong. So, you know, there, there are a lot of scholars who have received their degrees based on the interviews and work that they've been doing with our experts, and yet they still get the information wrong sometimes. So, I think still, if you go to the source, you're still going to get closer to the truth than in any way else. It's also, the more closer you get to the center, more closer you get to the source, it's still going to be better than it is farther and farther away. Now, as I said, our, the way we have our knowledge organized in these silos, right? Now, so where, where groups maintain a certain way of doing things, that um, this thing has to be tied this way or painted this way, or this has to go this way in this sequence. No, it can't change. Generation to generation, year after year, 
It has to be that way. We were at the Mesa Verde National Park several years ago. It's in southwest Colorado. And we were looking at some collections there. And we were looking at them, looking at them. And we said, no, those aren't ours. Those are probably Hopi. Those are, those aren't, oh, these are Zuni. And the staff asked, how do you know? And we looked at them and somebody in our group said, we still make them exactly the same way. And we asked, how old are these? And they said, these are about 1,100 years old. And that's because, because of these silos, because each group is really strict about how this has to be said, how this has to be prepared. It stays that way. It stays that way. I think that if all Zunis, if the whole community had access to all the knowledge, you would not be intact, as intact. It would be like that game we play in school where you whisper something into somebody's ear and it goes around the room, goes around the room, and it comes out the other side distorted. It would be like that. If it was like that, if everybody had access to it, I can imagine like a burial ceremony where one uncle is saying, okay, we're supposed to do this, and another one says, well, I heard we're supposed to do it this way. Another one says, why? I heard we're supposed to do it this way. It would be, it would be really slippery. But the fact that we have these more tight silos of knowledge, it means that the information is more compact, more, it, it stays vivid and true for, for a very, very long time. Yeah, if I could maybe, I mean, if I could follow up on that, because I think one of the things that I was really interested in towards the end of the presentation when you were showing you know, a number of these maps, which are just incredibly beautiful, um, is it, it has to do with this question of um, uh, not necessarily, I guess, dissensus, but a kind of multiplicity of perspectives. Um, so just in sort of thinking about the making of uh, maps, I wonder if you could maybe talk about how you know, different artists are differently responding to maps that came before, building off them, playing with them, uh, and how we can see kinds of difference in dialogue emerging around uh, one kind of form that different people are working with. Right, when, when we were first starting to create these maps, um, well, I was, I've always been interested in maps anyway. And when I was, out of high school, I went hitchhiking for two years. We went all over the western states. And I remember, <laughs> I thought I was like that old TV show, Kung Fu, where the guy was kind of romantically going from town to town. But um, <clears throat> I don't know, some of you may not remember that TV show. <laughs> but anyway, um, I always had in my head, I, I knew my reference was first, from my mother, mm. because we all come from a woman. We come from our mother, and that's our first point. We are caressed and held mm. as a child by our mother and our aunts, our sisters, our grandparents, grandmothers. That's the beginning, that's our reference point, and everything else moves up from there. That's our beginning place. And I remember, as I was hitchhiking, I'd always think about mom. Mm. I always think about home and thinking about how I could get back. How do I do that? And I was sort of in my mind leaving breadcrumbs along the way. Mm. And, but yet sometimes I pick up one of these Ram McNally maps and think, well, I've heard of San Francisco. I think I'm going to go there. Mm. And I pick up a card, piece of cardboard and a felt tip marker and I just put you know, San Francisco and I hold it up and I catch a ride. Eventually I'd make it there. But there was a long odyssey. But on the way, I was sort of creating these, these maps of how I was getting to mm. places. But that was mine. That was my sort of pattern. Yeah. When we brought together these artists, uh, and by the way, I, I, I wrote some like poetry and I wrote some songs about that, that odyssey, that journey. But when, when we brought together the artists, yeah, some of them said well, uh, maps because there are many brilliant two-dimensional artists at Zuni. So you want us to make maps, okay. Some of them, we asked them to make some pencil sketches first of an idea of, of a Zuni map of the village. Mm. And some of them turned in pencil sketches that were, they had north, south, legends, a little um, uh, scale, everything. <laughs> and we said, no, that's not what we're talking about. 
and others were very conceptual. They had you know, mountain lion here, the representing the north. Mm. They had um, you know, clouds. There's this different elements in Zuni sort of sensibilities that were uh, representative of of directions, mm. but also you know, this, just ideas that were, as I said, vignettes. So sometimes when somebody is talking with you, like your mom tells you something, and then your uncle tells you something, and your school teacher tells you something about the same thing or same place, mm. you remember them, and, but the way the Zuni artists were doing is like a vignette of that information, a vignette of that knowledge, yes. and so on, and that made up the map. It wasn't, it wasn't the conventional kind of ideas of a map. So, but I said, cool, you know, let's well, yeah. let it ride, man. That's, that's, if that's the way we're thinking, sure. that's the way the map should be for Zuni. Yeah, fabulous, thank you. Uh, we have a question right here. Yeah, so this thought isn't fully <laughs> formed yet, but I'll just go with it. Um, so there's this, you know, this notion that either, you know, Native people, um, I think if we think about dominant discourses of Native folks, that, you know, they don't exist or they're sort of, trapped in the past, they're attached to traditional practices. And I was wondering in your own, in your own work, um, how you work with um, contemporary artists or, um, or native artists who, um, who like don't return back to tradition, but somehow sort of comp combine contemporary practices or performance or um, with, with traditional practices, if that makes sense. That's a very good question because um well, um, in a couple of weeks, I'll be speaking on. <coughs> excuse me. I'll be speaking on the commodification of arts, of, of native arts, and that definitely had a big influence on it because uh, some of the arts, as I was displaying, like the images of the carvings in the rock, that those are it's art in the rock, carved into the rock. But there were there were also messages. It was news. It was information. But also the people that were carving into rock had a sense of some sort of spatiality of you know, not being too busy, but busy enough to get a message out there. And maybe another artist came in, typed in, you know, picked in a few more, then it was busy. Another artist moved down the, down the side of the, the rock face and said, I'm gonna carve in here because that area is too busy. Um, but also with ceramics, for example, um, my, my grandmother made, made ceramics, made pottery, and I used to watch her do things all the time. And I remember looking at it, because I was, I was disciplined in school already, right, with, with school books and, and maps and photographs and film. And so when I was looking at her pottery, and I thought, I, I don't get it, what's that? And she'd say it was a bird. I mean, guys, up if you can find that one image of the, the pottery, I want to make a I want to make a point also. But she'd say, "Well, relax." Basically, what she was saying. Um, what I'm what I'm drawing here, she would say, is um, something I saw. And I want you to look at it. And I studied it, and I said, I still don't get it. And she'd say, no, look, there's the wings, there's the tail, and the clouds are in the background. And I'd, I'd look at it all directions, and I, you know, and I finally was getting it. She was very, it was all abstractions. And it was brilliant, really. It was brilliant. And so there's, I, I really loved the, those old things. I don't know if they were able to get them, that's okay. But now today also, we have artists that are making um, digital art, for example. And I said, cool, you know, whatever falls out of you, art just falls out of you, you know. You can't, you can't do anything but let it fall out. And people are working with new materials, whether even silver is a new material relatively. You know, it's only 500 years, that's 400 or something, that's, that's not very long ago. Um, film, people are making films, people are uh, starting to do different kinds of performance art. I think it's wonderful. I think it's wonderful. What I think is interesting is that, um, uh, thank you, is, this one isn't, but, uh, but what I think it's interesting to me, and, I, and I'm, I'm just loving it, is, is that art still makes life worth living, no matter what. It's, 
it, it just falls out and it's just the most beautiful thing. Um, where I see sometimes, I, I don't know if I'd say nervous or anything, is, is that some, some artists, maybe they're arts and crafts, I don't know, I hate to use that term also, but they'll make things that buyers want. And they're, but, but the artist is just trying to put food on the table. And so if, if the buyers in the market is saying, you know what really sells in, in Europe right now are these things, or what's really hot in Japan right now are these things, can you make more of these? And the artist would make them and they'd say, no, no, I want, I want 50, I want 200 of these exactly the same. And the artist before that was so creative in making new things all the time, now is making the same thing over and over again. That concerns me. That concerns me. So there's there's the the, the, the arts, and I, as I said, I'll have a long thing, a long lecture just about the commodification of the arts. As before, like this, you know, these were just made for this. This is probably made in the. Um, Early 1900s, I'd say this one is probably around in the 1910s to 1920s, maybe. But <clears throat> I'll use a marker here. I know this is taking a little bit of time, but that's just want to point this out. Um, this is a bird. That's the head of the bird, and these are crests, like a like the crest of a bird. These are this is rain. Rain lines, these are rain lines. Remember, we live in a dry place, so anything that has to do with water and rain is important. And these are the wings, and this is the tail right here. But very abstracted, right? I love it. My grandma used to make some crazy abstracted stuff, and I loved it. She used to slap me around a little bit sometimes. Don't you get it? And then I, I did finally get it, I did, because I, I used to make some also. On that note, we're going to... Well, Jim has given us tremendous food for thought and uh, wonderful insights about uh, his incredible work. Please join me in thanking him again for coming to join us. Today.